Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for bearing with me. Um, Roy Howitt, uh, Keyboard Research Fellow at the Royal Academy of Music, um, Senior Research Fellow at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. They're both part-time, so I juggle between the two, as well as being a freelance piano player and writer and editor. It's my, mostly my editing work that's brought me <coughs> into this field, because for years I've been editing Debussy for the new complete edition, and Fauré and now Chopin for Peter's edition projects. And that has drawn me into the ambit of the Peter's, the new Peter's initiative, the Tido music application, which is an answer to what we're talking about today. It's <coughs> how we can go beyond the printed page and what the advantages are of going beyond the printed page. We've always taken it for granted how limited, how much the printed page limits us. Now that we, we can go beyond that, um, we have to make the efforts to think, well, how do we do it? Um, I've started by showing this here. I'm shamelessly waving these in the air. Uh, at <coughs> the midpoint between these, or the crossing point, is where we've taken some pieces onto the Tido application, which is a way of exploring a score. You get the score itself, but you can press buttons, hear the piece played, you can hear... Uh, you can read about its background, you can hear a master class about it, you can slow it down, you can get tips on performing it. They're building all sorts of things into it. And what I'd like to explore today are the, all the sorts of add-ons and the things I think that might be useful, the aspects of music, the underlying and circumstantial things that seem to me critical to our appreciation and understanding of something, particularly as performers but also as scholars, and how scholarship and performance can link into each other to help our understanding, and the ways in which I think this can gradually be worked into um, initiatives like Tido Music. The printout I have here, if anyone would like one, I've brought a few with me. It's of Debussy's first arabesque, and what it is, it's really a printout of the app. Uh, <coughs> first of all, they put the score, Peter's edition put the score, their edition, up on the app. They then got me into, um, well, these. That you have a background written about it. They got me in to give commentaries on it, play it, um, give some tips about playing it. So you can press buttons. If you have to subscribe to Tido Music to do this, but it's very cheap. Uh, and there are, in fact, a few free samples up there. There's some up on YouTube. I think you can find me doing Debussy's Claire de Lune on YouTube for this. But now that that's been done, they thought, well, let's go in the other direction. And they've done a printout. It's a sort of almost printed meta edition of the arabesque preceded by a transcript of what I've said about it and the background and followed by historical notes, which, of course, many editions can do. But it's very, it's very neat and compact. Um, so, and bearing in mind this background of this project, with which I've become um, quite involved in really just the... It's just over a year since it was launched, and we're putting up more and more repertoire into it, including things I'm editing for Peter's edition, which is why I've been drawn into it. Um, <clears throat> let's have a, a look at the ways in, in which... Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'll just retrieve that. The ways in which music invites us to go beyond the printed score and the way our present resources, I think, can start taking advantage of this. Here, for example, is a bit of Debussy. You may recognise it as Jardin sous la pluie uh, from the Diesto. Uh, it's this bit here. <laughs> from a piece that was composed just shortly before um, uh, Japan Sous la Pluie. It's from the Dolly Suite by Gabriel Fauré, a, a set of piano duets. Um, it's a, it's a, a piece that's always been known as Miao. It's the second one in the suite. Its real name is Monsieur Aoul. It was the older brother of Dolly herself. She was a young girl for whom these pieces were written. It's a little scarce that, go, that goes like this.
sur le son de l'enfant d'or, l'enfant dormira bientôt. <coughs> What an edition, what no edition shows at present, but what you can do if you have the e-resources is just show that up. You don't need to do that in France. If you play either of pieces, these pieces in France, um, the audience will start grinning, and any children present will start singing along with you um, <coughs> as you play, because they all know the song. Every French child is sung to sleep with that. Not, they don't need to be French. I sing my, I've sung my children to sleep with, with these. But you can see exactly where the words fit. And that the, the buttons you can press to make things appear and disappear are one of the most immediate advantages of, of what we can do electronically. And you suddenly see the link between these. <clears throat> By putting these next to each other, for example, if we have an electronic edition of either of these pieces, you can press a button to show where the other one will come up. And you immediately start sensing um, contextual relationships of how Debussy, despite his reputation, is the one who's very tonal, who has taken the key for quite a while. And Fori is a sort of tonal trapeze artist. If you're given that to harmonize for, for, a, you know, for an undergrad examination, who would think of doing that? Uh, so the, there are all sorts of options that are opening up already for what you can do. Here's, and <coughs> there is something else one can show at the same time. The, you can see the innate sense of humour and the very sharp eye that that particular composer had, Gabriel Crowley. That's him signing himself off in a thank you letter to a hostess who had had him to stay in Wales, in fact, over that summer. Um, <coughs> it's a lovely portrait of him, actually. It's as good as any. <clears throat> and then I passed to the other composer quickly. We saw that's something that's quite nice to show in his music. Why? Well, who is it? Um, it's a composer who, in his mature years, was famous for writing in three part cyclic forms. So there you see him already. If you've played him at the piano, you may t notice that his piano writing is quite left handed to an extent that's made many of us wonder whether he was a natural left hander. And he also, if you play his music, and I like to mention this, he treats the piano like a pair of pandal bars. He plants his thumbs, and it's the, it's, he works very much with the prehensile part of the hand. Plants the thumbs and the four fingers and works around them with the main melody often in the middle of the texture. And if you think, well, wait a minute, the guy was only five years old there. Let's have a look at him a bit later on and see where that left hand has been meanwhile. It's, it is his natural <coughs> sort of body language, and it comes through in his writing, and of course it will come through not just in his piano writing, but in his whole musical conceptions. Stravinsky commented on this with Debussy. He said that after he had heard Debussy playing the piano a few times, quite magnificently, on one occasion he sight-read the Rite of Spring with Stravinsky from the Piano Duet manuscript. Now, he could sight-read anything, apparently. But Stravinsky said, having heard him, he became uh, very vividly aware of how much Debussy's piano playing and the way, he, the way he treated the piano, how much that underlay his whole concept of composition. <coughs> it's quite a profound statement. It's something you can work into, <coughs> into any, any score, I think, for when you're offering a score for performing, rather than saying, this is just Chardin sous la pluie, here's bars one to such and such. It goes like this, um, vif to na bar. That's fine to play the notes, but all that sort of information <coughs> is the sort of thing we can have at the touch of a button now. And then we have the similar links from other pieces. I'm presently um, busy uh, editing Chopin's Etude for the new Peter's Edition project, which, <coughs> if you wanted to know about it, I could spend three hours telling you about the, the <coughs> what's rather exciting about what you can do after 200 years and 1,000 editions of these pieces al <coughs> already. There's still more to discover. But one of the things that's fairly well known about it is its links to where it's coming from. And again, this is something you can show ele electronically. Once you put it up on the page, you just see how the one runs into the other. Um, <coughs> Chopin, who's practically still a cheeky schoolboy when he was doing this, he was just coming out of his teens. 
And talking about prehensile use of the hand, there's Marshallis, the more mature, the older Marshallis. <laughs> his piano studies, that's the second of them, with something of a parody of Moshley's. These two men bonded, in fact. They, they remained, they became friends very quickly. Moshley's must have noticed this and taken it in good part. And he later commissioned the last three of Chopin's issued from, from Chopin. But that's another story. Keeping with Chopin, here he is again at the end of his preludes. A lovely bit of Boynton, which... Um, it's very remarkable. The Chopin's polyphonic sense, he, he was a great Bach worshipper. <laughs> something that came literally out of it on Chopin's centenary. A set of pieces appeared just called Twelve Preludes, Book One. Didn't say anything else about it, but it started with that chord, voiced in exactly the same way. And that was all, <coughs> Debussy being Debussy, a friend of Mallarmé's, that was all he had to say. <coughs> and if nobody spotted it, which very few people seem to have done over a hundred years, then that wasn't his problem. But again, and in addition, particularly in the Debussy, I'd like to, to point that out. Otherwise, along with that picture of Debussy with his right hand in his pocket, just to get us away from the... <laughs> the way we all bang out the top line <clears throat> with our little fingers. Something that can be put across, that musicians can usefully put across. Debussy, the way, was on, on record as deploring that habit of banging out top lines. And if you look at that, these pictures of them, you can see why. Look at that connection there. <laughs> Play from the Chopin. the sharpest of musical intuitions. Um, <coughs> Debussy was brought up on Chopin. He, he practically worshipped his music in the same way that Chopin uh, worshipped Bach. You can just see them linking at that point, and Debussy saying, 100 years of Chopin, here's a, here's a tribute. And being a subtle sort of person, he wasn't going to say homage to Chopin. Everybody had been thundering that out since the 1st of January, 1910. So he just lets that sail along in the wake of it. <clears throat> but there, there are again more samples of the sort of things um, we can do. Going back to Chopin, let's have a look at this. Here's the first edition of one of the most famous studies. It's one of the most stud famous studies because it's played by, by many famous who can't play the other ones. Um, <clears throat> and it has been, it's been turned into heaven knows how many sentimental songs. So still is die Nacht is one of them. Um, a Victorian one rendered as so still is the night, and so on, very slowly. What you rarely see in editions is where this edition came from. It was engraved very badly, I have to say, in France by a very <coughs> poor engraver whose sobriety I sometimes query because the, <coughs> the accuracy of the edition dips up and down like a yo-yo as you go through that collection. There's the manuscript that um, came from. I hope I'm not. Slandering the man. I don't think I am, because if he was sober, then he deserves <coughs> a, a few brickbats for having engraved so badly. Do you notice anything particular about it? Well, you'll see that the, 
in the forest stick for lag in its resulting edition. They are remarkably different in detail. Some of that can be put down to revision, but some of it is just, uh, I think, um, damage limitation by Chopin. But the most remarkable thing is not the engraver's fault. That must have been Chopin's change. You can see that the word lento is a little bit out of line. That was obviously changed at proof by, by Chopin. So what's it doing saying disaster? Um, we usually do this piece at a very slow. <laughs> to this comes in the last of his nocturnes which starts lento it's a slow four in a bar well slow by his standard slow in these days meaning just meaning not fast it doesn't mean as slow as you possibly can and here's the center of the piece which keeps that slow beat and then gets agitated within the beat so if I start that <coughs> nocturne again this is all material that one that's there at the push of a button in our paper edition of the issues, I'll have to make the all red possible references I can, I'll, and I'll be saying, I think a solution to this dichotomy can be found in the last of Chopin's Nocturnes. But at the push of a button, you can see it and hear it. Here's his, this is Chopin's slow four in a bar. It's a very characteristic tempo that you'll find in many Nocturnes and other pieces. <laughs> information and all pertinent leads that may give us insides, insights. Um, I think, oh yes, well you want, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute where that's coming from. But for me, there are contexts there that the electronic push of a button can, can help us understand in performance. Would you like, before I go on, there might, do you reckon there's time for me to play that etude through the way, the way I think he must have meant it? I prob there probably is a time to give you the nocturne huh? not just mark this piece. But listen to the etude, because you could then go through the middle section of the etude without it sounding like two pieces that have been badly stitched together. <laughs> Thank you. 
last nocturne, I'll just pick a potential section of it. for people who are exploring these pieces and I hope that will be useful. Let's go on here. Why am I showing you Clapton Junction? Well my idea in doing this is again in something <clears throat> that we did well it's the signal it's the it's our musical signal box really. Um, <clears throat> it's my view of Balakarif Islame which is one of these key pieces which picked up you can as <clears throat> as you go through it even at half speed like I tend to um, you suddenly think he's taking that from this. I know where he's taking that from. That's come from Chopin. And it's not literal, it's like any composer, you find what's good, you rework it, reuse it. Um, <clears throat> but there are particular Chopin things. And then, as you're going through it, you think Debussy took that, Ravel used that, and so on. The, <clears throat> that was one of these key pieces, 1869. Um, <clears throat> in a way, it's, a, it's, it's the foundation piece, I think, of modern Russian music. Um, <clears throat> at least instrumental music, and it had an enormous impact when people like Ricardo Vignes and, and a few people before brought it to Paris, and people like Debussy and Ravel heard it and thought, we well, could do something along these lines. Um, <clears throat> branch lines from Chopin's <clears throat> third ballad. What's that doing? Sure. Well, the, um, I'm thinking of... <laughs> That's teasing. That's Austin 
Because I'm thinking of that um, in Islam, eh? when you come to the big crescendo. <laughs> to be able to travel through time from one piece into another, it takes you into the composer's brain. You, you become aware of what the composer knew and what was going around all the earworms in the, in the composer's head around that time. What else will I show? I'm going to jump through a bit because time is racing. There's, that is just more of the same. Uh, I will have to skip this just from the point of view of time. I'll take you forward to one 
<coughs> a mysterious statement by a composer who liked to tease. My trio is finished. I only need the themes for it. What did he or she mean and who was saying it? <coughs> well, the quotation came from Ravel to his friend Maurice Delage, who was also his composition student and a very, <coughs> a very good friend. Um, he had been working on it for a while. The key to that statement is probably uh, Ravel's um, fascination with Edgar Allan Poe, and he quoted particularly Edgar Allan Poe's essay, The Philosophy of Composition. You possibly know that essay, in which uh, <coughs> Poe revisits his poem, The Raven, which had just come out a year before, I think. Uh, <coughs> and it's a beautifully written essay. It's very entertaining to read because he's teasing us as he writes. He's, he's saying, you may <coughs> we may well think that, if, uh, that a writer or a poet sits down in a frenzy <coughs> of inspiration one day and the ideas pour out. Well, it's not the way I work. And I propose to show you now how I wrote the poem, The Raven. And you're, as you read through the essay, you can't help thinking, did he really do that? He can't have. He can't have. He can't have. And many people don't believe it. The only thing is that once you've read the essay, and taking all the analysis of the raven, taking it back to the raven, and notice how he describes the unusual hyperbeters, the unusual structures that are in that poem, you think, actually, these structures can't have got there by accident. He must have done it that way. <coughs> but you read the raven, and you'd never guess that until, unless, he told, unless he told you. Ravel adhered to this philosophy, and he said, that's the way I compose, and that's the way I would teach anyone to compose because you have to be, you need métier, you need to know what you're doing. And <coughs> again, uh, how this can <coughs> go into our musical uh, presentation, I think is shown by the third movement of Ravel's trio. It's a, it's a long, it's a slow, <coughs> long piece. It's a big trio, four movements, lasts a good 20 minutes or more. It's a fi at least a fi five or six minute passacaglia, the third movement. Here it is, and here's a map I drew of it. I was long aware that, that the piece f felt very geometrical and very architectonic. And the more closely I looked, the more I realized that it was, in fact, a mirrored structure, an arch structure. I was thrown for a little bit because the sen at the very center of this structure, you're not aware, orally aware, of anything like the climax of the piece, which comes a little bit afterwards. Um, but when you look around it, you, s you come in from the two ends and go against time from the end, you realize that the two processes, they're transpositional symmetries in that a process going in along in time is repeating itself in time, but it's also being, there are also mirroring symmetries in this structure. So we <coughs> the three instruments, the piano, violin, and the cello, all present the theme at eight bar intervals for 24 bars. And they, you know, they come in one after the other. They disappear one after the other in the final 24 bars. The theme continues for another eight bars before the second theme enters. The same thing is mirrored towards the end of the piece. The second theme enters and exits in each case 32 bars after the beginning and before the end of the piece. And in between that, you have the terracing of the two climaxes based on the two themes. Um, and the center where the two themes collide in counterpoint and the one disintegrates under the attack from the other. I'm suddenly aware of real symphonic musical processes going on here and gradually I look back at my trio is finished, I only need the themes for it. He had thought out like Edgar Allan Poe what he was going to do, how his themes were going to behave. And this for me when I play the Ravel's trio now, I start noticing how the different themes in it, in fact the themes are all closely related. But what marks each one is not just its melodic shape, but is how that theme behaves through the movement. This theme will go on for a long time, for a couple of minutes. But it's their conduct, how they affect the structure of the piece. It's a way in which we often don't think about music. Um, <coughs> and again, I think seeing, and I would love to put a map like that into an edition of the piece. If I were editing it, I would well, the trouble is, there's one of these for every movement of the piece. You would have to write a little monograph about the piece. But if you have an edition, you can say press a button to see the shape of the passacaglia. Passacaglia, there it will be above the music. <coughs> it might look, if you pass the cursor over it, it will light up, click it, and it, it can show you that. And <coughs> I think, do I just have time to give you another few minutes? 
Good. From there, think of how this sort of thing marked the <coughs> the the mid twentieth century with the with the mid twentieth century's obsessions with structure and number structure in music. This one is based on multiples of four and eight, <coughs> which are often disguised. But I'll move on from there. Think of now we go to the Darmstadt School, for example, and the way in the sixties. 50s, 60s, 70s, if you went to a concert of that, you would have been handed a bit of paper. Now it could be electronic. You'd have a screen up. But then you would have been handed a little bit of paper telling you the number series and whose permutations this piece had been built. I, st I still remember hearing this. Um, in fact, even, as, even into the 80s, I was out here first hearings of a work. So I'll take you a little visit to Darmstadt on a, on a hot summer day. And here's Bruno Heinz Jaya's. Sommergewitter in Darmstadt from 1968. Um, and here's how it works. He starts with the numbers 3, 2, 3, plays around with them, and you get 5, 3, 5. Play around with them a little bit more, and you start getting 5, 3 makes 8, and 8, 5 makes 13. You might recognise these numbers. The Darmstadt School and almost anything that was going on in Europe in the 60s and 70s got fascinated by these Fibonacci numbers. And then if you're going to make a storm out of it, you just add, you keep adding to it, you get 13 and 21 now. At that point, <clears throat> the piece I'm looking at does something very strange. It starts with eight bars and then four and then five, four. And it looks mathematically odd because we're working here in a mathematical structure, obviously, in this piece. Um, <clears throat> What's that four doing? It's the only odd number. Well, in fact, there are two ideas that are being played off against each other at this piece. And I'll play you in a minute, and you can hear what it sounds like. Don't, you don't need to grit your ears too badly. It's not one of the, <laughs> the toughest concrete pieces. Um, there are two ideas being played off against each other. One of them is eight and then five, which is our right numbers, and the other is four plus four. And together, of course, one of them makes up 13 bars, and the other makes up eight bars. So even that... Everything is built up on these numbers 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. And if you want to make it sound like a storm, well, there's a sort of image of a storm, and that's the sort of structure one wants to emulate in the music. That's just a photograph of a cumulonimbus, a strong storm above New South Wales a few years ago. Here's how you would link up the numbers if you were doing this. Imagine you're in Darmstadt and you wanted to do this in the 1960s. Um, <coughs> Now, don't look at the screen a minute. Shut your eyes, because I'm just going to have to start the music going, and I've just realised this will give the game away. I'm going to play it. Oops, and there's this crescendo that goes through, and the trombones come in at the crucial point. It hasn't started playing. I'm just... It should start playing now. And let's... Mapping the music as it plays here, it starts. out Yayard by Claude Debussy uh, 50 years earlier in, in La Mer. <coughs> Let me just get the sound off there. Shall I stop it? There we go. Um, <coughs> I'll gradually wind up 
from here, but I just wanted that as an example. Some of you may know about this because it's a sin I committed long ago. I did it, I published this analysis. But that's, <coughs> of all these funny numbers working in Debussy's music, that's one of the most dramatic ones. And again, for anyone working on Lamer conducting it, playing it in the orchestra, it'd be nice to be able to click on the score somewhere and see how the various sections of this work, which are very, very clearly demarcated, as you'll hear. There's not a single thing going on that didn't make sense to that map there. Um, it could be Darmstadt, except it happens to be Claude Debussy 15 years before. And in a way, you can see how much he marked the 20th century. Although I'm not sure how many of the Darmstadt composers knew that this was going on in La Mer. If they did, they kept very quiet about it. Um, <coughs> but again, that would lead me off in another track. <coughs> I'll, I'll come back to my central point of the way we can present, the way our resources now let us look at musical presentation. And for me, the implications for projects like Tito, whose, in, whose founder, Brad, has just joined us. I'm delighted to see um, <coughs> so, um, <coughs> Brad knows about my, my ideas here, and we're gradually building up what an application like Tido can do. We're not the only publishers doing that. Henley are going into, into electronic presentations, where, for example, if you've, all, if you've ever been anno annoyed by the editorial fingering in Henley editions, you can now press a button, if you're looking at it on screen, and say, presto, the fingering goes away. You're left with only the composers. That one makes me happy. But that's... <coughs> It's interesting, but that's, that's just the start. It's, it's where our musical exploration can go from there. And I hope in all sorts of creative directions that will set composers off with ideas for music as well. I must stop there. It's time for lunch. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>